Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. This is the kickoff event for Lift the Curtain in partnership with USITT and their conversation series. I'm John O'Dalion, and I will be introducing our organization and our moderator for this afternoon's panel. As a reminder to everyone watching at home, you can ask questions in the chat bar, and we will attempt to pass them along to our panelists. Uh, today's panel will be answering questions about internships, providing their own personal stories, and discussing how you can be your own advocate when you're looking at internships in the future. Before we get to this afternoon's discussion, I wanted to provide a little more information about Lift the Curtain and who we are. Lift the Curtain started in June of 2020 in response to current events in the U.S., specifically the promise of theaters to look at their labor practices and also the promise to add more diversity to their organizations. The reaction was kickstarted after our moderator, Eric Hart, put out this tweet. This tweet led to a growing group of artists and technicians who came together to speak about their own experiences and to start the discussion about how to enact change in the industry. This led to a Facebook group, the initial internship survey, and finally our current group, who we are today. LTC as it exists today is an advocacy group made up of theater and live event professionals who wanted to change the perception that unpaid or underpaid internships were necessary for advancing in the industry. It's built upon the shared experiences of its organizers and volunteers and the collective goal of a more inclusive industry where socioeconomic privilege is not a prerequisite for success. In order to carve these entryways, we are using a combination of education, outreach, and data gathered from organizations and interns, many of whom might be watching today. We hope to help people learn how to advocate for themselves as well as to provide resources for organizations that are looking to end their own unpaid programs. As a group, we've had many conversations about what we stand for, both individually and as an organization. As a product of these conversations, we came up with the following commitments. We, as a group, want to seek to challenge classism and racism through ending inequitable internships. Parallel to this commitment, we are looking at how other barriers such as racism, sexism, ableism, and among other things are interconnected. We understand that the theater world overtly excludes people on the basis of uh, on the basis of class and economic status, and that this is easiest to see when it comes to unpaid internships and the reliance on unpaid labor. We also understand that many of these barriers are interconnected. One directly feeds into the other, and we are gathering data to see how other factors contribute. We want to look at how lack of arts funding within communities creates a need for unpaid or volunteer labor. We want to look at how the attitude about internships at the college level affects students' careers and their, pa and their uh, career paths. Uh, we want to look at how the expectations of higher management and artistic boards uh, uh, create a demand for more technically challenging, time-consuming, and expensive shows, and how these demands eventually trickle down to the interns. We also understand the continued need for more information and data. With that in mind, we commit to understanding that these barriers uh, commit to understanding these barriers and to build upon the work of other groups such as We See You White American Theater, Be an Arts Hero, and the Broadway Advocacy Coalition, just to name a few. We've added links to these groups and more, and they can be found on our website. As a group, we decided that we should continually attempt to improve and hold ourselves accountable. And we decided to do this through a joint effort of transparency, training, education, and outreach. More than who we are and what we stand for though, you should know why it matters. And you should know why it matters to you personally, as well as why it should matter to our industry as a whole. One of the main reasons it matters is because American theater suffers from a dependence on unpaid labor, and this dependence devalues skilled labor in our industry. I'm sure many of you have a story about an internship that you were either a part, that you were a part of, whether you were the intern or whether you managed a department that had interns. That firsthand experience is, has highlighted the fact that unpaid internships limit the number of emerging professionals and obstructs inclusivity and diversity in our industry. LTC hopes by abolishing these internships to create a safer, more economically sustainable, law-abiding, racially diverse, culturally relevant, and more accessible industry for everyone. In order to ensure that we can reach this goal, we started with just a few basic ideas, which included creating a set of standards by which to evaluate programs nationwide. These standards are gonna be available on our website, as well as an overview of the formula we use to determine how equitable programs are. The formula we use takes into account a few things, one being compensation, IRS status, and another being travel status and compensation. And this, we use these to provide a score that outlines how equitable each internship actually is. 
developing resources for interns as well as organizations and theaters who wish to update their practices or who are looking for information on just where to get started. Our website currently has a list of articles and the social media links of other advocacy groups to follow and support. We are just scratching the surface of this work. We're planning on evaluating 729 theaters nationwide. So far, we've completed an evaluation of 114 theaters and evaluated about 74 programs. This is only about, this is about 15% of our planned goal so far. We're, do, we're a small group looking at large data sets. Each individual theater is being researched and graded using our formula. It's a large amount of data that needs to be gathered, collated, and double checked for accuracy, which is why we're gonna need help from other theater artists such as yourselves. One way we've found to help others is, by, is to show by example. And we want to include, a, uh, and we want to highlight success stories and advocate for the expansion of these tactics that other places have used. One of our future goals is to speak with theaters and programs that meet or exceed our expectations to learn how they found the funding, the time, the staffing, and really the support to create these programs, and then to provide these strategies to other theaters and organizations. We understand that every city, state, and region has its own challenges, but we hope that ideas from one region can help spark ideas in another. As part of our outreach and data gathering, Lift the Curtain has put together a panel of professionals who are willing to speak about their own experiences with internships and apprenticeship programs. At this point, I'll be turning things over to our moderator, Eric Hart. Mr. Hart is a professor of stage properties at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. He has worked in theaters all over the country for the past 20 years. He is the writer of the Prop Building Guidebook, the Prop Effects Guidebook, and the upcoming Prop Building for Beginners. He will be introducing our panel and moderating this afternoon's discussion. Eric? Thank you, Jono, and thank you, uh, Lift the Curtain, and thank you, USITT, for giving us the chance to have this public discussion about unpaid internships. Um, I know it's a, a conversation a lot of us have been having for a long time, but especially in this uh, uh, last year and this long break where we can all sort of step back and think about things, um, it's a really good opportunity to really uh, dig into a lot of the issues around unpaid internships. Um, we have a great panel uh, uh, giving this discussion today, uh, and we'll start with uh, Karen Loftus. Karen Loftus, is the program manager for Roundabout Theater Company's Theatrical Workforce Development Program. This is a three-year technical theater training program for 18 to 24-year-olds in New York City, and it is a partnership between Roundabout and IATSE. Hi, Karen. Hi there. How are you? Good. Yeah, good. Next up is Natalie Taylor Hart. Natalie is a freelance scenic designer and associate professor of performing arts at Elon University in North Carolina. She is a member of Local USA 829. At the beginning of her career, she did seasonal work, internships, and overhire work in Broadway scenic design studios and in the prop departments of theaters in New York and the Santa Fe Opera. Hi, Natalie. Hello. Next, we have Kimberly Chatterjee. Kimberly is an actress and an arts worker. She is a Senate team manager for Be an Arts Hero and the Actors' Equity Association Eastern Principal Delegate. Hi, Kimberly. Hi. And finally, we have Tracy Armagost. Tracy is the production and recruiting coordinator at the Santa Fe Opera, which runs one of the oldest apprentice training programs of its kind in the US. Each year, nearly 80 apprentices are chosen from a pool of over 900 applicants. Hi, Tracy. Hello. So great. Uh, let's kick things off. Um, I believe we will be taking questions throughout this panel if you want to ask. Um, and our wonderful team backstage will be feeding us the questions. Uh, we have gotten a lot of questions already, and we're going to do our best to work through all of them. But of course, we won't be able to get to them all. We do hope that this will be an ongoing conversation, either on our face on the Facebook group or uh, within other groups with Lift the Curtain, um, or even a future USITT webinar just like this one. But uh, let's get started and jump right in. Um, I wanted to start off uh, with a simple question that a lot of people ask, which is why are unpaid internships bad? Uh, many of us have started out with unpaid internships and learned a lot from them. 
So I think a good question is, what are the consequences of uh, having unpaid internships in our industry? And let's just open it up and whoever wants to take a stab at that question. Um, I think uh, the limitation of who can take those internships is a really, really large part of it. Um, I work, uh, you know, our program was developed to um, try to, to uh, meet those gaps so that young people could train and um, have internship experiences and roundabout would be covering um, the, the payroll for that. And it would just be nice to see it uh, kind of take root a little bit because it eliminates quite a few people who would be able to have that wonderful experience that you had. And I myself, when I came to New York when the earth cooled, um, had an internship that paid $65 a week and, and very, very hard, obviously, to survive on that. But due to my privilege and the fact that I was in graduate school, I was able to do that. So who is able to partake in these internships um, and who you're forgetting is really important to keep in mind. I think another part of it is that it, as uh, Jono said, it devalues skilled labor. So there's, uh, you know, while an unpaid internship might be a good choice for one individual student, um, on the whole, it creates a system that's dependent on low wages, unpaid labor, college student labor, and, and then it drives down that labor, um, those wages in the, the next job. So when that intern graduates from the internship and gets a job, um, likely the wages are not going to be a huge step up. And, and that has, you know, certainly a lot of consequences for our students, a lot of consequences for our emerging artists, but we even you know, can see that it, it trickles down in your life too. So you might be in your 30s or even 40s and not have any retirement savings. You not It's like a prolonged adolescence, right? You can't really start creating the things that we think of, of as adult stability or, um, you know, financial stability until you're well into adulthood and you'll never make that up. Mm. So there's, there's a big system-wide impact from, from these types of internships. And additionally, just as a mindset in this industry, it's already rampant. You do it for the love of the art form. Um, people are, you're sort of punished for loving what you do, even though it's a job that requires specific skills that you are taking the time to learn and hone. Um, so just from a mindset perspective of maybe you've just graduated college or your early career in whatever form to accept that it's okay to not get paid for the skills that you've learned is a dangerous mindset that's already prevalent um, and gets reinforced over and over again. Right. I, I was lucky that I um, I was my apprenticeships, both apprenticeships that I did early on were paid apprenticeships, but I wouldn't have been able to do an unpaid apprenticeship at all. Um, financially, I, I couldn't have done it, especially if it was one where it was unpaid and you weren't allowed to do have a, an outs another job you know, so that you could pay your rent or you could pay, you know, so like you all have, have said, it, it really limits um, students that have the, the skills and the capability um, are unable to do that or unable to be a part of an unpaid apprenticeship. They just financially couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to throw one more thought in on uh, what Kimberly had said about the valuing of your skills it also leads to kind of a scary slope of the valuing of your experience too. Um, you know, the ability to overlook that microaggression or that inappropriate behavior or that unsafe condition. Um, so, you know, that the ability to really value you and your skill set and your career is really important. Good, good. Um, and, and how can we teach students in the performing arts um, that their time and creati creativity have value, um, especially like you say, when performing artists are so frequently asked to donate their time and their talent? As the college professor, I'll, <laughs> I'll chime in. Um, <laughs> I got that one. Um, we tell them and we tell them often and we tell them specifically and we say, 
this work that you're doing is awesome and it has value. And I see that you're donating your time because you're a student or because that's what the situation is. But I want you to know that that has value. And I want you to know that you're part of a bigger system that if you work for free, if you don't value your own work, then other people won't get paid for their work. You're not going to get, you know, compensated as you gain experience. And I, you know, as a, as a professor, I can't, um, underline enough how often and specifically students need to hear this because I think we're really trying to, you know, turn the, um, that big uh, ship, whatever that metaphor is, uh, because that's really the opposite that our current culture is. Our current culture asks us to give so much, like Kimberly was saying, because we're passionate about this work, right? Um, and, and we have to work, you know, really specifically, really hard um, and show them, you know, why it is that that they're valuable and what it means to us. I, I'll, I'll quickly go through a thing that I tell my students that I especially had a, a student a few years ago who was awesome and would just do everything, but she would burn herself out. And I, I would tell her that your experiences are like this jar and that in this jar is like all you can do. It's all you have the time for, energy for, or whatever. And the experiences that you put in are coins. And so, you know, it might be a small thing and it's a penny. It might be, you know, you're designing a whole show and it's a quarter and you get a lot out of it. Um, or it might be that the experience is really a penny because you're not going to learn anything from it, but it's your best friend and it would be fun. So maybe it bumps it up to a dime or something. But, you know, at the end of the day, don't end with a jar of pennies is the goal. Make sure that what you're um, for the energy that you're putting in, that you're getting something out of it that's going to be worthwhile to you. Um, and hopefully <laughs> that's helpful with students to help them think about valuing um, what they're doing with their time, with their skill and their labor. And I think Natalie, I'm, I'm, um, I'm out, I'm not a professor, but I'm in that yeah. area a lot, right? Recruiting and interviewing. And I have to say, there are still many of a professor that still say, you got to pay your dues, you know, you got to pay your dues. And I am, I am still to this day, constantly telling the students, mm, you don't, you know, yeah, I, I think we can, I think we can reframe that as building skills and experience. Exactly. Because exactly. That, that's a thing that we all need to do, but we all too probably know that, um, that there are multiple paths. There's not one path to this industry. There's not one age at which you need to enter it. I was a high school teacher and I went back to grad school in my late 20s and entered this a little bit later. Um, and I like to tell my students that so that they like, okay, okay, I got this, I'm cool. But yeah, I think, it, I think that, you know, that's another of that cultural thing that we should um, reframe a bit and try to empower students rather than, um, trying to, uh, you know, I don't know, put them into a place or put them into some kind of mold. You can't do this until you do this thing that's hard. Let's not set them up to be abused or, you know, to be, um, you know, taken advantage of. Let's set them up to be empowered um, so that if they do decide to take on something that's hard or take on something with low compensation, it's at least an informed decision that they're empowered to make. I think too, this is making me think that there's a difference between say shadowing someone when you're observing where you're not necessarily using the skills, but you're watching other people work in a masterclass setting or something. I can understand how, th how that might be low paid or unpaid because you're watching somebody work. It's not taking up your time in the same way, but if they're relying on you to get a task accomplished that is necessary to the work getting done, then you are now an integral part of the team and you deserve to be compensated appropriately, whatever that means. We're not saying everybody's going to make $50,000 a year on an internship, but, but if you're, if you are giving your skills and your time and your labor, it's not wrong to say, I also need to eat or like, I couldn't go to work because I was doing this and I'm happy I'm doing this, but I can't eat based on what's the phrase like, 
I can't, I can't get paid in exposures. <laughs> like I can't eat exposures. <laughs> I can't eat experiences. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, so, it's, ahead, it's just it's important for us to um, for those of us who are um, farther along in our careers or connected to the various organizations to fight the fight on that level as well, because that's a lot to put on young people's shoulders. The thought of, you know, looking back at my 18 year old or 21 year old self and thinking negotiate for something. What? Um, you know, so the more help that we can give them, too, because theaters will mimic each other. You know, I was making $65 a week and all the other theaters were also paying 65, 75. So, you know, things tend, tend to competitive wage is competitive wage. Let's just make it a higher wage type of thing. And I think that's where transparency could really help. Like there have been um, organizations recently like Art Search now requires you to post the salary or the wages. Um, anytime you can have transparency of pay, that gives people more information that they can act on strategically. You know, another thing that I think could help with this is um, is to just post the jobs. You know, we know that happens a lot, like through SETC and USIDT. Um, you know, in a lot of companies, especially for like the summer internship jobs that a lot of college students are taking, they do have job postings that you can apply for. But a lot of jobs in theater, there's no posting. It's that networking who you know thing. And that's another route um, to exclusion. It's another way that we're gatekeeping um, to, to keep people out. Um, so I see, yes, USITT requires a salary to be posted now. You know, again, I think any time that we can offer transparency, it will help that, um, you know, the theaters following each other, like Karen said, and it puts more empowerment in the hands of the students, the emerging artists, and the lower paid workers. Cool. Um, we're talking about uh, the, the traditional path and, and internships. And I like what Kimberly said about shadowing versus internships. Um, what are some options outside of the traditional path of internship, either op options that are uh, paid opportunities to further one's career? Um, are there any aspect of those opportunities that internships can imp implement to be more equitable? Um, and I'd love to hear from Karen, because your program in particular is, is very unique and has actually helped other people throughout New York realize that you can get paid for this while still learning. Yeah, I think it's um, it's about the very paths in and, um, you know, our industry is so much about relationships. It's about, it's, it isn't so much about who you know, it's who knows you and what they know you for and all of that kind of stuff we all know from marketing. And it's about creating those relationships and those opportunities to meet people. I think that's going to be, you know, networking events that are like a cocktail party and schmoozing, that's one thing, but the ability to go backstage and meet the crew or the, to meet the designers and have meaningful conversations with people so that they get to know this young technician or young artist on a personal level, um, that's, you know, people hire people that they want to be, you know, is it the Tina Fey thing about who do you want to be by the uh, photocopier at three o'clock in the morning with? And that's that kind of idea of who do you want to work with? So helping to develop these relationships is really important. And for our fellows, um, it had always been uh, the thought, oh, you have to go to college. You have to go to college. Not that you shouldn't go to college, go to college, everyone, but you don't have to go to college. And um, you know that there are other opportunities but uh, that was a very rambling way to say experiences that create the opportunity to build relationships whether that be shadowing lunch uh, we have a thing we do in our program called lunch with the industry back when we met in person we literally ate pizza together so you know those kinds of um, relationship building will help with the career building as well Cool, thank you. Um, anybody else want to chime in on that? Well, I just want to say that that's such a wonderful, I, I did a, a paid apprenticeship as an actor years ago, but 
uh, on top of watching wonderful performers work and learning those skills and then understanding all those things, it it is about the people that you meet. All I think the th the next three jobs I got after that were all from people I met at that apprenticeship, and to to consider that you're setting them up to succeed beyond your institution, not just with the skills that you're giving them, but also the people that you're meeting. You want to set them up with a whole host of people that now have access to that person and their skills and says, hey, I remember meeting them that one time. And, or if they send you an email or submit a resume, um, because I find that some internships can really just to be about that institution. It's just about making a show for that theater and not about how am I setting it up so you can go forth and have like a list of, na of names of people you've now met and can feel comfortable saying, hey, you remember me? We had lunch and had this great discussion. Um, Cause that's so much of working in the arts anyway, like what Natalie was saying earlier is just meeting people, talking to them and, and I don't know, becoming friendly with them. The more that you can do that within your own internship, the better that internship is for everyone involved. And I think it's also partially the idea of like lifting up those who are coming after us. It's, you know, taking what we've learned and the opportunities that we've had and making sure that they're they're given to the next generation. Like I did that with my students. I made sure to network network them and take them places and make sure like they knew that there was other stuff out there. Great. So another question that's coming up in a number of forms is on how internships create a barrier uh, to, to a lot of different people. Um, unpaid internships hurt the BIPOC community and create a barrier of entry for them into the industry. Um, how can we work to change this? Well, I identify as a woman of color and I know that I have been a party to the gatekeeping and also been affected by the gatekeeping. Um, I think we're in an incredible moment right now with having this great pause and people actually having a chance to talk to each other and learn about others' experiences in these programs and come collectively towards these different theater companies and say, we've all had this experience and you can't treat us like this anymore. Or... I was, you know, one of X number of BIPOC students in this group of 30. And there's a, it's still scary to advocate for yourself at any age, I'm finding. It's scary every single time. Um, but we have this great opportunity of collective. The internet is a scary place, but it can be a wonderful place where you can post in some of these Facebook groups and be like, hey, anybody worked at X theater? I had this experience. And now you have 15 people who say like, hey, I'll back you up. Let's reach out. Um, there's also avenues that like we see white American theater, right? With like very public posting. Um, but m the best success that I've had, which is very limited, um, has been joining forces with other people who feel the same the way, the same way I do and reaching out very directly, very intentionally to leadership at these theater companies. Um, varying tones from aggressive to polite, but reaching out and saying, this is what we went through this is what everyone has been going through. This is no longer acceptable. What are you going to do about it? It doesn't mean it gets magically fixed overnight, but the more that you can do that, the more you can go to the source and say, this is not acceptable anymore. Specifically speaking of like, in my situation, I was one of like two or three people of color in my whole core cohort. Um, and illuminating for them step by step how that came to be with, even just the number of days auditions were available and the times they were available and the pedigree that was required to even get an audition slot. And where, where are you going to advertise this apprenticeship? Like what schools are you reaching out to? Um, all those kinds of things. But I say all that, and that still puts a lot of the onus on the people that have had the experience that have already affected or been affected by the traumatic experiences. So I can't, necessarily condone that for everyone and say, hey, people who were abused, go take on all the labor. Um, I have found that is how I process things. And I'm like, I'm going to try and change this and do it now. But speaking to what everyone has said earlier, if you as a person of power can recognize these things now, 
and you can take action with your colleagues, that is going to be so much more um, influential, I think, than what than asking the people who are in the disempowered position to keep struggling further and further. And I'll say that like advocacy from any portion, any higher up portion, whether it's professors, mentors, anywhere, if you're advocating for the students, like I never would have known about getting paid for internships or anything about like the Santa Fe Opera, which I, which I worked at. I wouldn't have known that unless like my mentor came to me and was like, hey, you, you should get paid for your work and we want you to succeed. Um, and if we don't, if we don't have people doing that, then you, they, then people don't know. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, uh, we don't want to put too much on the students who are trying to find these jobs and figure it out themselves. Um, but what do we say to the, the, how do we tackle the question of institutions that say we don't have enough money to pay interns, staff, employees better? Um, do you eliminate these opportunities altogether? How do you choose between um, having an unpaid uh, opportunity versus having no unpaid or no opportunity? Or is there a way to, to do it, do it all? I'd love to hear from people who have access to budgetary things, which usually performers do not, um, because I have found that they magically find the money when they need it. So <laughs> maybe that's not always true, but I'm curious. I mean, as a production manager as well, like you, you budget, you know, and you make choices and you make changes and that designer might want that $3,000 sofa, but you don't have the budget for it and you move things around. So yeah, it may mean you have to alter some things. I don't think you have to you know, be so over the top and get rid of all of the experiences. It just might mean you have to trim from certain areas in order to get that money. But I also wanna say, you know, if your business, if you were a business of any kind and your business model was built on the exploitation of someone else's labor, then that that's wrong in general. So we you wouldn't want to see this done in any other industry. And the idea of like, we all do this for the love of the art, that might be great when it's a group of friends starting out a, a theater company and doing some amazing and wonderful creative work, but not when you're s established and have staff and things like that. Um, everybody should be paid something. And instead of the disgruntledness about paying an intern um, minimum wage or whatever. Uh, it's the same argument you see happening in the news right now about minimum wage, where people are like, so you're telling me a burger flipper deserves minimum wage. Don't be angry in that direction. Be angry in the other direction, because you can look up um, different, you know, different people's salaries uh, and see what's being spent. So it's just about priorities. And it may mean having to trim some things, but it doesn't mean you have to be dramatic and get rid of everything. Um, people who deal with budgets know how to rework budgets. So if it's something that really matters to you, you'll make it happen. Yeah, budgets are a reflection of a, of a company's values, I think I've heard said before. Um, and Tracy, the Santa Fe Opera has a giant apprentice program. Um, do you have anything, uh, uh, any way of, of teaching how to make that happen or make that work? I mean, I, I've been part, well, I started out as an apprentice at the opera, so I've seen it over the last 35 years evolve, you know, a lot. Um, when I started out, you know, it was a stipend, free housing, um, I don't think we got assistance with travel. I was going to look that up and I didn't have a chance. Um, but in, I think we started in 1994 is when we started paying an hourly wage uh, with overtime, uh, travel assistance, assistance with housing. Um, and to me, it was a no brainer that it should have always been that way, you know, right? Um, and we had some um, really good uh folks in our production department at that time that really were like, we got it, we just have to make this happen. And they made it happen. So um, they were advocates all around. And um, 
and through the board of directors, I'm sure we're involved. You know, I wasn't involved in that particular part of it. I was a recipient of it, but I wasn't, um, you know, on the deciding committee, so to speak, um, for that. But, um, you know, they just, like Karen was saying, the, the money is, they have to find the money. Um, and, you know, to hear companies say, we can't do it, we can't do it, we don't have the money, well, then maybe you shouldn't be a company. You know what I mean? Like, it's 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 that important. Um, those positions are just as valuable as, you know, the, head, the lead soprano in a show. I mean, to me, that's, they're all valuable. They're all equitable, you know, so they all should be um we keep we keep saying the word value which is which is what it is there every position is valuable um and the respect um your position even if you're an apprentice you you should get the same respect as as you know the lead dis set designer that's just that's how i've always operated in my brain right um that it's all should be it's part of that team and it's very very important and when companies say they can't they can't do it. You know, we have to have this core of unpaid people, then they need to rethink their, their plan and their, their mission and how the money goes around and, and cut that $3,000 couch, you know, like that's, it can be, it can happen. I mean, it's, it, and it takes work and it takes a lot of planning and it takes a lot of juggling those numbers around. Um, but it can happen. So, um, and, I don't think it was Kimberly that said it can't maybe not happen overnight, but it can happen. And we've got lots of good examples like the two of you and many other theaters in the country that I would imagine this is not my side of it at all, but I would imagine if a theater company was looking to start something and didn't really know where to begin or it seems impossible that that there are people through USITT that they could reach out to to, to get help and how they made it happen. And yeah. we, you know, I, we're, we're lucky enough that we do have, um, you know, there, there's folks that sponsor, um, there's patrons that, that do sponsor apprenticeships and that has grown in number in terms of how many sponsorships we have for that. But that's, that's also a way um, to accomplish that um, through that source too. Um, and it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work from the development department, from everybody um, to accomplish that, but it can, it can happen. And that's part of LTC's work too. That's some of the things that we're hoping to do is to have these resources available mm -hmm. on the website so people can go and see the ideas and see the ideas in the forums too. Just have an open conversation and say, look, we just don't know where to start. Who has ideas? Right. We have people who have like we have people who have been through it and we're working to navigate the same thing. So I think yeah. it's too to have um, larger scale theaters partnering with smaller theaters as well. Um, and that's been a really, really wonderful um, kind of offshoot of something that's happened with our program is um, Ironically, roundabout, all of our spaces are union and our fellows can't work in them. So I think the cobbler's children has no shoes. But um, we reach out to all of these amazing theater companies, the Atlantic Theater, the public, and work with them to continue this educational experience for our fellows, pay for our fellows to be their interns, and then they partner back with us and hire the fellows. So we're trying, you know, so this model does exist and I know it exists in other places during some of the, like I sat in on, um, uh, with the opera production managers and there's amazing, obviously with Tracy and Santa Fe, there's amazing stuff being done in the opera world. So the idea is also, can we like stop being so uh, isolated in our approaches too? I, I am happy to be anyone's feeder program. <laughs> Please contact me. There's when people say, well, you know, we just can't find people and I'm like, got a list, check in. So, you know, working together, partnering with each other um, for the same goal in the end would be great. That's great, thank you, Karen. Um, I, I think one of the trickiest things is when you're just starting out, um, you may be aware that uh, 
you know, you should be avoiding unpaid and underpaid internships while also desperately needing the experience they provide. So how do you advocate for yourself when you're starting out? Like, what are you actually allowed to ask for when applying to a job or an internship? Oh, what I tell my students is, um, you know, I think that when they when they have the first interview, um, to try to create, you know, establish a relationship with the interviewer, talk about the passion for the work, talk about what your goals are, um, you know, talk about the the particulars of what you'll be doing. Certainly, the skills. What you know, what are your expectations for somebody that's in this you know job that you're considering me for? And then, you know, usually the way it works, especially with SETC, that sort of thing, is there's those initial interviews, and then they call them back for kind of the second round. So I've counseled my students that that second round is the time that they can talk about, um, you know, ask more about the salaries and the benefits and all of that. Now, you know, again, I think that's kind of where we are in the culture. Um, again, I think, I hope that we're moving to a place of more transparency where it's really fine to advocate for yourself and talk about those things sooner. Um, but, you know, again, like we said before, I think that's a lot to put on a student, to put on an emerging artist who's not doesn't have the power that groups have but i think if we can all kind of make this move collectively then we'll get there you know so if we can all help our students understand how to approach this and businesses can even be maybe more upfront about it that's what and saying. yeah like if you put it out there then the student is invited to talk about it that information i think should be available whether that's in the job posting or, you know, on that company's website, a contact for someone that you can have that initial conversation with, um, I think is really important um, so that they know, they know what they're applying for and what the position expectations are um, before even having that first conversation, because it not, may not be something that's, you know, that appeals to them. Um, but I think it goes back to the companies need to be transparent also with that information and these um, hiring conferences that that are held should also say, you know, those organizations should say we need to know X, Y, Z before you're even a company that can be a part of that program um, is is my thought. So the transparency from the company initially is I think is really important. Yeah. I also think, too, if you can learn, depending on if you're going out of state or like picking up and moving your life for an internship, if you're doing it in the place where you already live, ask, you know, is this something that I can maintain another job with? If you, if you can make it work with a part time job and an internship and are you willing to work around my schedule? Uh, what does the schedule look like? I don't think that, in my opinion, is presumptuous or out of line at all, because if if you can make it work doing both and that's something you're happy to do, you should be allowed to do that as well. And and they should understand that that's more and more the world we're living in. People have multiple jobs and um, that needs to be an expectation as well. Cool. We, we have a question in the chat about how students can find reliable internships. And it's related to an earlier question we got what are some red flags that you see in internship and job posting listings? Well, to find internships, you know, again, our organizations like SETC and USITT are great. Talking to other students, professionals, um, talk to your faculty, um, maybe others have better ideas about how to find them. There's some like an organization that Eric and I are both in society for prop artists and managers has a list of um, internships for in props. And so distributed amongst the members so we can help advise people that way. Um, red flags, uh, I would say, um, you know, certainly not having pay transparency is a red flag. Um, I think sometimes there's coded language in job postings that sort of hint that the situation is not, um, what's a good word? <laughs> it's just not a good place. It, it's going to be hard. You're going to be working too many hours or, you know, I've seen one that's kind of gone around Facebook lately where it hints that the people that 
or supervisors there are not nice to work with. Um, but then there's also the one about the like kind of family and passion language where they're basically asking you through coded language to exchange passion for pay because you know you're passionate about the job or because you you know love art or because you want to work in a you know a theater that feels like a family that those things are being provided to you instead of actually paying you um, so i think you know people who were posting jobs we need to look at at that we're not accidentally putting that coded language in um, and again, you know, how to be transparent and upfront about what you're offering. Yeah, the biggest red flags for me are when they don't men mention pay whatsoever at all. Even if someone says a stipend is provided and that doesn't give you a number, it gives you a sense that maybe this is something I can negotiate or there's some money involved. If there's no mention of money, unless it's like your dream scenario, I would be wary of that. You know, another thing about internships in particular is that you should be learning from someone. You shouldn't be the department head if you're an intern, right? Or you shouldn't be the only one in a department. Um, so that's another thing that, that students or emerging artists might ask about um, if it's not clear is who, who do I report to? What am I going to learn from them? Is there time that's focused on my learning besides just getting the play up? Is there time that I can make a mistake, <laughs> you know? Um, that's really important. It, you know, if the intention of a program is to educate, that's different than, you know, the mission of the business of putting on a play or an opera or whatever. And they can coexist beautifully, but if you are gonna have an internship, you have to have that intentionality of education and provide the time and the space for that. If the supervisor is only ever gonna be concerned with getting the show up and there's not time structured in for you know reflection, talking, feedback, whatever, instruction, then that's not an internship. That's just a job. Mm -hmm. And then another question is, is college credit fair compensation or just housing or just travel stipends for an internship? I think it should be an addition, additional thing. Um, that's what we do here. You know, we're, we're happy to help facilitate that with the students. However, we need to facilitate it, but I don't think it should be in place of pay or um, that type of thing. I think it could, should be an additional thing, but not the principal way of paying them at all. The student is going to be paying for those college the credits hours, anyway. Right? Yeah, you exactly. have to pay the tuition. So it's like a double hit. Yeah. Right. You know, and again, I've had students who have gone into these situations aware of what's going on and they had the resources to do it and you know and it was fine so again you know for an individual person worker for the individual job maybe it's okay and everybody you know knows what the deal is but it, you know again looking at it as a whole system of how we're providing education and labor it really builds problems um, into the into the system not the least of which is exclusion um, on lots of, you know, racial exclusion, financial status exclusion, caregiver status. If you had kids, I've even seen pets be a deal breaker <laughs> in places. Um, certainly ability and disability, you know, on almost every, this can touch almost every way that people are excluded. And so, you know, getting into the mindset of um, trying to avoid this gatekeeping, trying to be it truly inclusive is going to help everybody. Yeah, and given the lack of compensation of theater jobs in general, um, how can the future of internships help provide alternate industry entry points that don't require the substantial investment of undergraduate and graduate training? Because um, I know, you know, I, I've seen part-time minimum wage jobs uh, advertised that require a master's degree in props. Um, are there other ways we could go about this? 
I know it's that two to three years experience for an internship always makes me scratch my head. It isn't this what this is supposed to be is. And um, the idea that it, I think also this, I think someone had mentioned earlier, the ripple effect that fighting for this situation will help everyone in the industry uh, instead of people grousing over rightfully paying interns and entry level technicians let's let's keep that moving as well and compensate everyone for their skill level and their years in the industry and all of that and and again you if to get what you've never had you have to do what you've never done so if you're a theater company you just have to change the way you do things because otherwise you can just sit there and scream, no, I can't, no, I can't. And um, it, it might mean a, a three show season versus a four show, show season. It might mean a leaner fourth show. It might mean a, a lot of different things, but there's also money out there as well to be had to help um, with early career professionals. And that's why our program is called the Theatrical Workforce Development Program is because we've, um, we get a lot of wonderful uh, support from the workforce, um, you know, world, uh, Jobs First New York, and uh, we're part of a, a thing called Young Adult Sectoral Employment Program. So we kind of, kind of looked at it differently, like look outside the box to see how can you do this, where can you get the funding. Um, it's just going to help everybody all the way up the line. Um, yes, so we had a, another question. Are there examples of actions that have reached uh, boards of directors in addition to staff leaders? I know there's been a lot of talk about boards of directors and, and how they're often uh, uninvolved with the, the world of theater and unaware of what actually goes on. So I'm wondering if anybody has examples of, of how to convince you know uh, people outside of theater that it is in their interests to have, to, to get rid of unpaid internships, have paid internships or just paid entry level opportunities. I mean, this seems to be quite honestly, the biggest barrier is convincing boards. And I know the success that I've personally found when fighting for this kind of stuff in places I've worked or almost worked um, has been the first step was sort of well, it's, it's whoever that you have the connection with. If you have an a, a artistic director who is understanding and who wants to do their best, but, you know, but has been disconnected from the reality of what the unpaid internship experience is like, then going to them first was very beneficial to explain this is what it costs like a week of living my life and doing this job. I just don't think you know, because you don't, we're down here and you're up there. I don't say that part, but I'm like, this is this is what it costs to be a human being and, and you're expecting us to do it for X amount of months. And this is why it's unsustainable. And if you can convince those powers that be why it matters, their job is to go to the board and be like, you know, this is how we are using your money. This is why this matters. Because ultimately it's difficult to convince boards or donors or whomever who it's much nicer to have something tax deductible or like a, their name on something that'll last forever. But shifting the narrative to like, so you are sponsoring the next generation of artists and creating stability and a foundation for them to flourish for the rest of their lives. That's what your money is going towards, is towards, yeah, art for the future. Um, but I've found that route has always been through someone on the artistic staff side first to, sort, to get them on board as well. And then they go to their people. But I'm curious if other people have have thoughts about other ways to go about it. I've never been staff at a at a theater, so I don't know. I've been in the box office, but mm -hmm. I don't deal with budgets there either. <laughs> There's also the legality of everything that I think we need to make these theaters aware of. Um, you know, what defines an internship and what internships are uh, you know, there's some legal issues there. You know, there has to be an educational component to an internship. Um, otherwise, it's a job. So, you know, I think it's 
not only is it the the current like the right thing to do from a moral compass standpoint, but it's also, you know, it's going to be better for you because somewhere down the line, you're going to get hit from a business perspective for illegal employment operations. So it's just a win win all around. Like this isn't this is not this is no longer a it would be great if this is a this has to be done. Like it's kind of funny having this argument because I feel like we're arguing arguing about climate change. It's like it just it exists, believe me. So like how do we how do we get how do we get people on board from a business perspective? How do we get them on board from a legal perspective? And then how do we get them? And Kimberly, I love your idea of it again, it's that relationship building. It's really easy to ignore and abuse the people you don't know. So that kind of make building those relationships so that the people who do control the money see the effect the money has on the company. Yeah, I know, Tracy, one of the, the things I noticed at Santa Fe Opera is that there's uh, donors and patrons regularly taking uh, tours through the shops and learning all about what we do in the shops. And I know at a lot of theaters I've worked at, the shops get separated even from admin. So even people on your same level and admin don't know what you're doing. So it feels like it takes a lot of effort to 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 train train well, the board on what we do and sometimes yeah and sometimes the the donors or the potential donors they have no idea what is what we do back or how in, intricate it is i guess they know they obviously know that we're back there doing things but um and we have we have amped that up a lot actually um and make them aware of of all these different components and what it takes to do a show and how many people it takes and we do um sort of insider looks for them and it has really helped on that end um just to give them kind of the inside peek of what what it is that we do and it gets them more excited about it and it has really helped in terms of of the awareness for those donors that we eventually then have on board um, and like I mentioned before, we do have um, apprentice sponsors that are donors. And out of about out of, a, a lot of the singing apprentices are sponsored, and about fifty percent of ours are sponsored. Um, and there's there are donors that have done that for years on end, and that is that is great because that also puts value to those positions in terms of um, in terms of that. So that's a good point eric is that the more that we've we've started to have invite those <laughs> folks back where in our world are back behind that you know stage door um has really been eye-opening on many levels for them i should also no. mention that i actually i work for being arts hero which i haven't talked about at all but um we're also fighting for just federal funding <laughs> like fund the arts, mm -hmm. which would help with a lot of this. So it doesn't come down to individual patrons and donors and, and mm -hmm. a wealthy elite class of people. Um, so that, I mean, that's a larger overarching goal. We're trying, we're fighting for relief for everything that all the suffering during COVID, but then beyond the relief, we're also fighting for a new future as our people like Jeremy O'Harris and the talking about federal theater project. But if there's subsidy, if there's federal funding or state funding, which obviously some theaters and, and theatrical spaces have access to, but most don't, um, trying to move away from this individual donor uh, model because it is incredibly difficult and it puts power in the hands of a small group of people. And um, so we'll get back to you on that when we get it. And we're gonna get it. We're gonna get federal funding. We're fighting for it very, very hard. Um, but that's long-term. Hopefully that would help with this as well. <laughs> To, I think it to, would. I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. And there are other countries that have national internship models, for, not just for the arts, but for all industries. And as an educator, uh, it, it's such a cruel thing. We make young people decide what they want to do for the rest of their lives at the age of 17. Um, the opportunity to intern before college, to intern after college, just so that people aren't put into such crippling debt. Um, is so very, very important. And yes, um, another works progress program would be fantastic. Yeah. Let's get that happening. New deal, new deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Secretary of Arts and Culture. 
we're fighting for it. Yeah, and uh, it does feel like since we don't have a good kind of national funding model for the arts and theater, we do basically subsidize it on a lot of unpaid labor. Um, and like Karen said, you know, the dirty little secret of theater, a lot of it is potentially illegal. Uh, and we have a question, what do you do if you believe your internship is illegal? I'd imagine this is from the perspective of, of, of an intern. Um, uh, what do you do? Because a lot of times you feel like you need that job and you don't want to burn any bridges. You know, we, uh, we tell young people how important it is to maintain mm -hmm. their network. I mean, I think the first thing I would always ask is the issue of safety. You know, there's there's illegal and then there's safety. Are you physically safe? Are you mentally safe? Are you know, are you OK as, as in terms of like, do you have to leave now or do you need to address this now? But then also, what resources do you have um, to do the research on whether your situation is illegal um, and who can help you with that? Who's your advocate? Uh, and that's important too, to provide advocates for young um, and early career professionals so that they don't feel that they're alone um, and that they don't have to do all the legwork themselves. But I think turning to an organization like Lift the Curtain would be a first step um, and seeing if you could find an advocate or someone to help you through that process. And then it, it could be a, an honest conversation with your employer. Um, about that it, it's a choice about whether you want to speak out or not and that's a, a very difficult choice um, and i i say that as someone who started their career in a very much a culture of just push through just push through ignore 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 um, and i i am so incredibly proud of the young people who are stepping up now um, but finding that advocate to help you fight that fight i think would be step Yeah, it could be tough just to find somebody to talk to about it if you're at a summer stock and everybody you know is also at that summer stock. Um, can higher education help solve this problem? Should we be teaching our students about labor laws and what makes a legal versus illegal internship? Yeah, I think it's great. You know, I'm always on the camp of putting tools in students' hands putting information in students' hands. So, um, you know, we, at my university, we try to prepare them, you know, for the jobs, including a transparent look at, you know, what they should expect when they get there. But, you know, maybe that's something that we should add to it as well, um, or at least um, provide resources if they get into a situation that's, that's not working out. Um, you know, I, I definitely, <laughs> certainly in the hiring process and even during the summer, um, I've had lots of students that, that text me throughout, you know, this is going on, you know, I need help. It might be just a, a technique or something, but, um, you know, I think college professors, since we're that kind of, you know, we're mentors, we're that student's um, advisor throughout their years in college and even beyond. And so um, I think we certainly can fill that role to to at least connect them to resources. I also think too, and I, I know I said this earlier, um, and social media is a tricky thing, but a positive thing about uh, Facebook specifically are joining all these various theater groups that could be giant and they can they also get smaller and smaller depending on what you're looking for. And I've seen, I've just, as another person in the group, seen lots of posts being like, X, Y, Z is going on, I don't know what to do. And even if it's just like two different people who say, message me, you never know who that person is and, and, and what they can do to help or what resources they have. And I think, at least I'm speaking for myself when I see those, I never, I guess I would say, that's always an avenue available if you're not ready to take it to the organization yet, or if you're not sure if you want to be the one person fighting the fight. There are thousands and thousands of people on groups like Facebook or groups like Lift the Curtain um, that are available just to be an ear and just to give advice based on their own experiences. You don't have to feel 
like I'm going for the fight or I'm not. There's there's room in between. Um, and I think something Jonna said earlier too is if you're ever debating whether or not to fight the fight and you feel safe enough to do it, even if you're okay, it is for the future generations. I have been lots of places where I made it out just fine, but it's a prop it but I had a lot of privileges that allowed me to make it out just fine. And or or, or it, it didn't my friends didn't make it out just fine. And um if that's something that calls to you of like wanting to be an advocate for others, it is an incredibly powerful tool. Um but of course I totally understand fear of retaliation is real. Um especially if you're an early career artist, but there are more and more people who are doing it more and more often and more and more publicly. So I'd like to think that you will find support. Not that it's gonna be an easy road, but there are people out there that will support you from within your mm -hmm. community, and from around the world. And they're on social media and on Lift the Curtain and other places like that. And even like alumni from your university, if you went to a university, um, there, there are a lot of people, um, yeah, that can reach out and help help you figure out which direction you want to go, and maybe even be that advocate for you. Great. And we had another question earlier about how is this going to flow into the high school and middle school teachers, uh, uh, middle school theaters, because um, they're not necessarily preparing their students for the career yet, but they still have this opportunity to kind of educate about what should be expected from an internship or an entry level job. Thoughts on that? Um, I, I encourage the, the teachers to continue the work of um, uh, teaching their students of the importance of all the positions in a theater company. Um, and that that's very important because sometimes on the high school or middle level, the focus shifts so dramatically to the importance of performance. Um, that the technical and design side, um, they can work to help um, uh, expose their students to the different types of jobs that are out there um, and and maybe meet professionals in the industry uh, as a way to guide them towards where they want to go. But that, that, that importance of um, teaching them that everyone is part of the storytelling and that we all have an equal job in it um, will also help to build their self-confidence in what they're doing, but it starts to build that sense of, I value myself, I value my skills. And that takes us back to the conversation we're having today, where I feel confident advocating for myself because I value the things that I can do and I'm excited about learning, but I do need to be paid for the work that I do. And I will say in some of our meetings and like committee meetings, like in Lift the Curtain, like we've talked about that too, is like how far does that attitude go back? Because all of us can remember college. And I mean, I left academia as a student and academia as a staff and employee not too long ago. And there were still people who advocated for you do any work you can, you pick it up, you take it, you slog through, you get the experience and someone deems you a professional on the other side. But as I started thinking it back even further, like in talking with other people, the the show must go on, the show at any cost attitude starts as early as like high school and in some middle schools. Uh, so that's another thing that we're looking at as a group too, is like, how do we get resources to colleges, but also how do we get resources to high schools, middle schools, where they are entering college with the idea that this is how things work and this is how internships will be and jobs will be in the future. So we are thinking about it. I think it's so challenging because, you know, we work in an industry that's also some people's hobby. And so some people want to put all of their extra time, but they probably have something else that sustains them as a job. And I think, you know, you can certainly disagree with me or we could debate this, but one of the maybe things that differentiates is that those of us who are, have gone into this professionally have made investments in time and education and, and experience. And it's, and it's what we do all day. Right. Um, and, but I think that that's hard. And I think, you know, I've seen that people don't understand 
why we do or how we do or how things work sometimes because of other experiences. And, you know, and just to be clear, I think that's awesome. I think high school, middle school theater is so important. I think that community theater is so important. I think arts um, expression is a component of, of wellness. But, um, you know, but, but you do have to at some point put that business hat on and, and, and with it comes that culture, you know, what, what's the culture that we want people to, you know, what's, what's the difference in the culture between community theater and professional theater, not in terms of quality or value, but in terms of, um, our expectations of the people that are that are doing the work and how they should be compensated based on their experience, skills, and investment, right? Um, and I think that's where high school and middle school can also start having that that conversation. And and you know, just like career day for anything, some people do this because it's super fun and it fulfills them. Other people do it for those same reasons, but also to get a paycheck. You know, and here's how that's different or here's how this plays out in people's lives um, to create, you know, to start putting that culture in before they get to college. Great. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I want to make sure we hit this question. Um, what are your suggestions for people who want to organize and do more to help change our industry? Um, and let's start with Kimberly, because you mentioned Be an Arts Hero, which has been a great organi uh, uh, organization that has come out in the last year. Yeah. So, and I'll just share briefly how I got involved, which was um, back in July or June. A friend of mine was making these videos, a sort of a state-by-state -state campaign of how much money arts and culture contributes to the state and reaching out to different senators. And I helped edit like five of them. And she did the other 45. <laughs> and I reached out and I was like, if you need help with anything else, like I'd love to help. And they gave me one tiny task and another and another. And then now I'm managing a bunch of people. But um, th so that, for example, is a volunteer organization. We, nobody makes any money. Um, we are all volunteering our time, but now, but just like any other group, it's like certain people are volunteering so much of their time, they deserve to be compensated. So we are taking the steps <clears throat> to make so people are compensated because that's what you are supposed to do. Now that we've become, we went from a group of friends, sort of what Karen was saying earlier, and now we're an organization. So we have to go through the growing pains of taking that step. But all that to say, um, reach out to groups like lift the curtain or be an arts hero or Broadway for racial justice. There are so many grassroots claim our space now, so many grassroots organizations that are made up of volunteers, people that work once a month or people that volunteer five times a week. Um, people are always looking for help. And I feel like, especially in the time of this great pause, there's so many grassroots institutions, or you can found your own group of people if you want to take on your educational institution or your theatrical community. Um, now is the time to do that. And, and people are always looking for volunteers, especially from like young, smart, tech savvy people. <laughs> I had to relearn how to use an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so that you all have skills that we value and need and expertise that we value and need and, and welcome at any time. And we are, and Lift the Curtain is actually doing a lot of that. It's like we're getting all of those resources together and adding those to our website. And we do have a list of some of the advocacy groups that are uh, currently, uh, that are out there right now. You can go to our website, check out the resources, go to them, see where you want to help out. There's so many different parts of theater and things that, and about our industry that we can start changing now. But everybody's going to need help. Mm -hmm. Cool. Great. And any way they can get involved, Jono? Is there any way they can get involved? Yes, there is. There's plenty of ways they can get involved. Uh, on our website, we do have a, an email address. You can just send us an email and be like, hey, I can give you like three to five hours of my week, or I'd really like to be involved with PR or outreach or any of the things that we're doing, or, hey, I'm really good at graphics, website development, things like that. I'd like to offer some of my time. Send us an email. I, 
I was connected through a friend of mine who was like, hey, you seem to be interested in this. Like, you should email this group and see if they need any help. And now I'm here on a webinar. <laughs> so <laughs> small steps, small steps. And I actually, um, at our last slide, we'll have a list of all of the Instagram, Facebook, all of our social media, and all and a lot of the upcoming events and where you can find us. Cool, great. Anybody else? Awesome. I think this was a great conversation. We hit on a lot of things, um, and I'm sure there's a lot more we can talk about. Um, and there are ongoing conversations happening, like we said, on the Lift the Curtain Facebook group, on lots of other Facebook groups, on social media all over the place. Um, there's not many theaters running right now, but there are a lot of uh, educational institutions where people are having these same conversations as well. So hopefully they'll continue and we'll continue to, to do this great work of tackling these unpaid internships and, and finding a much more sustainable, inclusive, uh, uh, professional industry for the future. Um, so thank you all of you, Karen, Tracy, Kimberly, and Natalie for joining us today. And thank you, Jono, for uh, uh, having us here and all the members of Lift the Curtain for putting this all together. And thank you, USITT, for uh, uh, allowing us to have this conversation. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, the last slide that we have up here and for the people who asked about specifically about volunteering there is our normal email that you can reach us uh up on the screen right now but you can also reach us at volunteer or lift the curtain at gmail.com send us an email let us know what you're interested in let us know where you can help and let us know what time you have um, once again i'd like to thank everyone for coming today. It was really great to be able to put together this panel and to talk to everybody individually at the beginning to see what we could kind of create and how we could come together and have this discussion. I appreciate all of your experience, all of your insight and everything you brought to the conversation. Uh, before we end, uh, I wanted to make sure that people saw all of our, all of our social media links uh, our website, uh, a couple of people asked about where can we find this information? Uh, where can we find the formula? It is on our website. We have a resources page and a data page that you can check out and you'll find the formula and you'll even find a graphic breakdown of the formula so you can start to understand how we're calculating these things. Uh, the email address is at the bottom, volunteer for lift the curtain at Gmail if you're looking to volunteer. Um, and finally, USITT is honored to host this event and other conversations in our industry. Um, we invite you, as Lift the Curtain, to join in a few of their other upcoming events, which include uh, February 11th is their collaboration conversations featuring director Alejandro Cisneros and designer Anthony Aguilar. February 19th is their community conversations with focuses on the work of Asian American designers and managers. I'm going to check that one out, actually. And finally, there's the Virtually Anywhere Conference, which will be March 8th through the 12th, and that is all online. USITT's work in equity and diversity is supported by the Tanisha Jefferson Fund for Inclusion, and you can find more about these events and all of the programs at usitt.org. Thank you again to our panelists, to our moderator, to everybody who joined us today. We appreciate your time, and we hope to see you at the next one.